Welcome to another exciting edition of the Trading Bell. This week we are coming to you from the INM Bank headquarters here in Parklands and we'll be speaking to the managing director who will be giving us some interesting perspectives into the bank and to tell us more about the outlook for the sector. Let's get into that conversation. Welcome to the show. Thank you. A pleasure to have you here and first time in your newly moved into offices. Perhaps let's just begin by giving us a snippet. The banks have been releasing their results and uh, what has been the story behind i and Yes, thank you. So uh, indeed uh, we've seen a round of uh, results as you expect at this uh, reporting time. And as you unpack the results, I think you can see uh, generally uh, the banks have done all done better. Uh, that reflects, of course, the underlying performance of the economy, which has also been improving post-COVID. Um, and um, the particular impact, I think, has been seen in uh, the interest income side. Um, the uh, moratoriums and uh, other accommodations that have been given by the banking sector with the support of the central bank that fell off in um, March uh, 21. Um, meant that now you could get uh, higher earnings from interest uh, uh, from interest rates, uh, from loan products, and uh, you've also then seen uh, pick up in your non-funded income lines, so your foreign exchange lines and uh, and uh, service fees also improving. So all around, it has been a strong uh, performance for the banking sector. Similarly for I and M as well, we have seen that recovery. We weren't as uh, significantly impacted by the um, moratoriums and all that you saw with other banks. Um, so while, for example, you had about 57% uh, of the bank loans being restructured back in 21 due to the COVID uh, crisis, uh, we only saw about 17%. But that reflected the nature of, of, of our book, which is more focused on the corporate side. All right. And uh, what's the, your overall assessment? Uh, are we out of the woods yet or still too early to make that call? I think we've seen significant uh, recovery. I think we still have quite um, uh, a bit of ground to travel with uh, the recovery. But I think it's also seen the emergence of new ways of doing business. Mm -hmm. So a lot of uh, digital focused um, services, um, and uh, reconfiguration of businesses that has meant that um, while some other sectors may have seen a decline, others mm -hmm. have actually seen some growth. And uh, what we have to do is take the disruption that it brought and see uh, what are the lessons from that that we need to take forward and what are the things that we need to discard as perhaps um, working practices that are now outdated. All right. And uh, Mr. Kiara, you've dropped a big word there, reconfiguration of banks. Mm -hmm. Just expound more on this because we're seeing banks already, uh, many have said COVID took banks five years ahead of time when it comes to ICT rollout as well as digital banking. What does this mean for your bank as well as for the sector? So indeed you have been seeing um, a lot of digitization of, of banking services and actually uh, i and had started on this journey even before the crisis started. So for banks like ours, it was more of an acceleration of uh, the digitization that we were already undergoing. And generally across the banking sector, certainly that uh, picked up. Now, if you looked at the uh, measures that were put in place to mitigate the effects of the crisis, um, they included significantly um, measures to encourage uh, the digital payments that um, had already started off mobile banking uh, and so on but actually to now allow greater uh, movement of, of funds between different operators. So uh, between the banking sector and the mobile telecom sector to facilitate easier movement and move away from, from cash. And that then uh, underpinned other, uh, other innovations that we had. So you've seen, for example, now you can order your goods um, uh, from a supermarket and pay for them online, similarly from restaurants and all. So uh, all of this gets powered by services being provided by the banking sector, right, to be able to move money, um, money about. So that was a, a significant accelerator. We want to keep the gains that have come from that and make sure that um, the more efficient ways of making uh, payments are, are um, uh, you know, continued. 
And um, this helps reduce the cost to serve really for uh, our customers. So we are all very happy that we've moved that extra bit. Of course, that comes along with some other challenges, right? So we know cybercrime is, is quite a, a challenge in, in the market. Um, and of course, when you make these early moves on the, with the technology, you will also get some bad elements that choose to take advantage of this. So we also have to look at how do we stay ahead of the curve in terms of, of uh, preventing um, these kind of risks from materializing and protecting our customers' money. Speaking about staying ahead of the curve, as a bank, your business is majorly composed of retail banking as uh, one of your big flagships. And at the same time, corporate banking is an area that uh, in Kenyan uh, the system is still fairly uh, underserved if you look at the big picture. From where you sit, where do you see growth and how are you uh, strategically positioning the business towards this? So um, just a, a slight correction. So we are actually um, more historically known as a corporate bank, right? Yeah. But we have been in recent years expanding our, our uh, retail presence. Now, how have we done that? Through the uh, branch expansion that uh, we've been doing. So we are now in, in several counties across the country. And we've also been looking at uh, the different customer segments and creating what we call customer value propositions. So really defining how we serve those particular segments. So we've been doing that for the business banking side and the, uh, what are also called the SMEs and MSMEs, mm -hmm. as well as the personal space now uh, in the retail banking proper, where we are now dealing with our uh, premium banking clients and our personal banking clients. Now, um, where is the opportunity to be seen? Well, certainly when you look at the corporate banking side, that will continue to grow. It underpins um, a lot of the, the growth that you see in, uh, in the economy. Uh, however, what you will see in that space is continued um, thinning of, of margins, as it were, because people get more price sensitive, they need to stay uh, competitive, they want services from their banks to be competitive. So, and, and because they are larger corporates, they tend to also have more choices when it comes to their banking. Yeah. So it means that you get um, tightening margins uh, over there. However, uh, on the other side, we also have the uh, SME side, which as you know, is the engine of growth for any country really. Um, when properly enabled, then you will see that uh, they grow, they uh, significantly employ. Um, a lot of uh, the new uh, you know, people coming into the labor market. And um, I think if we were to really solve some of the social problems that we have around um, uh, unemployment, then we really need to promote um, uh, you know, business growth, right? Self-employment uh, and all. So, so those are areas that we are now focusing on. So yeah. our MSME uh, team is very focused on uh, all of the elements that need to work together. How do you provide easier access to credit? How do you make sure that people are also uh, well educated about how banking works, how finance works, so that they are able to survive uh, the early stages of the formation and then uh, obviously be sustained into, into growth. All right. And uh, still staying on the same, uh, from your observation, uh, there seems to be a big interest in the MSME segment. What is driving this? How big a market it is? Is it, and uh, also at the same time, looking at this very important niche, it has also been classified as very risky. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the driver really is that, uh, well, not everybody can be absorbed into what you'd call your formal e economy uh, straight away. Coming out of school, and we already know how our education system uh, tries to prepare people for uh, both formal and non-formal um, uh, sectors. But we know that the rate at which jobs are going to be created uh, through the formal sector is limited, right? If anything, some of the advances that you're seeing in technology mm -hmm. are actually driving, uh, you know, uh, companies to actually uh, reduce the sizes of their workforce. So that means that you have to look to how you can get um, the uh, people coming into the labor market to actually get self-employed. Uh, and that's where the MSME side comes in. Now, yes, traditionally it is always seen as risky, and, and correctly so, because 
um, most businesses that are started up in, uh, t tend to, you'll see the majority actually end up failing within two years. And that's, uh, that's a, a, a challenging statistic to deal with. Now, why do they fail? Those are the th things that we now need to address. Is it access to uh, capital that they needed and weren't getting? That's where the banking sector can come in and say, how do we actually provide solutions to, to this? Is it about uh, understanding how uh, you know, business works, how finance works? We can do the education side. And we will work with partners like government and other development agencies to say, how do we actually reduce the risks that we face in, in, uh, this, in, in this sector? so that we can enable more businesses to actually survive. And uh, speaking about risks, uh, the central bank governor is on record saying that uh, he's uh, very cautious about the rise in non-performing loans in our market. And does this worry you? And are you seeing uh, a stabilization along those lines? So indeed, uh, we have seen elevated high, uh, levels of um, non-performing loans since around about 2017. And uh, obviously the banking sector working with the central bank have been working on how to uh, bring this down over, over time. And they have been uh, ticking down. In, in our case, for example, we have seen our rates uh, as of NPLs come down from about 13% to about 10% last year. And this is a, a process of working out with your customers on how you can um, you know, either nurse businesses back to life or realize the security is required to be able to offset the uh, loans that are no longer working. Now, of course, this is also driven by other macro factors, right? Um, we've uh, had interest rates influence that through the period. Uh, we've seen, of course, the economic performance and uh, the challenges that we had under COVID also would lead to some of uh, the elevation in the NPLs. But the important thing is to uh, make sure that you have a process of working uh, that book to see what you can do to get these uh, loans to perform once again. And if not, uh, speed up the realization process so that you can get capital to be released and, and start uh, functioning in the, in, the, in the economy again more effectively. So how does this play out, especially when it comes to provisioning? Because banks are also really under pressure mm -hmm. because of a rise in NPLs. So, well, there are two, two approaches that uh, we have to take into consideration. Of course, the central bank has provisioning guidelines, right, on how you should treat your non-performing loans. Um, and typically, it's what's the size of, of the loan, how much collateral do you have, provide for the rest if you don't... Um, uh, once the loan goes goes bad. And of course you've got the uh, IFRS approach which is um, then uh, looks again at uh, what are the expectations that you have around realization of cash flows from either sale of securities or uh, any efforts that you have to nurse back the, the loans back into into health. And then you provide based on uh, based on that. So we obviously balance those two. So if you look at um, the, the accounts that are produced by banks, you will see the, the disclosures that they have around uh, those elements. Now, what that tells you, of course, is that collateral is important, right? Um, and the better quality collateral that you have, uh, the lower your provisions will tend to be, right? If you've covered most of the loan with your, with your collateral, then you'll need to take very little provisions. But the more, uh, obviously, provisions that you take, uh, you, the, more, the higher your coverage is of your NPL, um, then, of course, uh, your, your, as you now begin the process of workout, those releases they, uh, then come into play. All right. Yeah. And as we bring it to a close, uh, a couple of headwinds uh, seem, uh, seemingly uh, taking a very center stage in the banking sector we do know that um, we have the upcoming elections, mm -hmm. uh, which may have some potential downside risks when you look at uh, economic performance. Then, of course, there's the elephant in the room. This is the dollar shortage. And it has also a big implication to a bank of your nature. I just want to get your quick reactions to this. So. Elections are uh, cyclical, really, and um, shall I say, dare say, we are certainly getting better at um, understanding how elections influence the, uh, the markets. 
it uh, does need to, from a business perspective to uh, really center around policies and what policies are actually best for the economy. Right? Yeah. Now, um, at this stage, what we are seeing, of course, is that uh, businesses are really focused on getting back on track post-COVID, right? So elections are coming and they expect that they'll be well managed. Yeah. And, um, you know, whatever the results, that we shall go on with uh, the business of doing business, right? So we shouldn't worry too much about the disruption that tends to come with elections. We know that it will come, um, it will come back around to... Uh, you know, doing business of the day. Um, with respect to the, uh, the the challenges that we've seen in uh, in with the dollar supply in the in the market, I think there have been several commentaries that have tried to explain that this is seasonal. You've had issues around um, the surge in dividend payments um, that has led to obviously a pickup in that uh, demand for dollars versus the supply that is coming in. The only bit I would add is that um, uh, this will stabilize, uh, certainly. It is just uh, a matter of the markets actually being able to manage that uh, smoothing out process. We have uh, banks operating as intermediaries and making sure that uh, uh, to the extent that their capital allows them to um, manage the exposures that, that arise as we are servicing our customers, then you know, that will continue. So we've had some of these um, dislocations once or twice, and we've come out of them on the other side strong. Uh, so I, I wouldn't worry a, a, about it. I expect that this is going to uh, be something that will be smoothed out very shortly. All right. We do hope uh, it will taper off eventually. I just want to get your closing thoughts, especially on your medium-term view for the bank and also for the region. Yes, so um, as I&M, we have uh, been um, operating our strategy uh, Imara 2.0. Um, we're in the second cycle of that. And it is very uh, focused really on uh, how we can uh, leverage digitization to drive uh, greater value for our customers. So our aspiration is to be Eastern Africa's leading financial partner for growth. And uh, you will see that our presence has extended now into Uganda. So we've got um, uh, uh, just last year the acquisition of Orient Bank, which is now I&M Uganda. So that completes our presence in the core East African uh, market. However, the reason that we get into these markets are, of course, that we want to make sure that our customers who operate across all these markets are, are served effectively. We're working on uh, optimizing our operations and, of course, increasing the resilience of our business through better risk management. And, of course, looking at other aspects around um, environmental, social and governance issues that help really uh, bring to the fore some of the uh, social challenges that we have to, to deal with. Now, so as i and we want to make sure that we bring all of these things together, even as we are um, really partnering with others for, for growth. So uh, expect that we will continue to look out for opportunities to uh, extend our business across the region. Uh, and certainly within the, the, the country, really look at how we can increase our penetration of uh, the segments that we talked about earlier on the business banking side, or the personal banking side and the premium banking side, leveraged on, on the digital assets that we are putting in. And we've been making some significant investments in that regard. Uh, we have uh, recently uh, partnered with Backbase, which is the leading digital uh, yeah. banking platform in, in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the first to do so in the, in the region. And um, off the back of that, we are now um, rolling out uh, our digital platforms. We've got i and on the go, which uh, makes it easy really to do banking from your phone, from, uh, from the web. And we will be uh, deepening the, the ways that you can continue to interact with the bank off the back of that. All right. And uh, in closing, of course, you've touched on the very important subject around uh, your strategy. And I just want to get your comment, especially when you look at the traditional brick and mortar, uh, banks are moving very fast from that. What are the implications of this to the sector, which has heavily been capital intensive when it comes to setting up new branches, establishing ATM mm. uh, machines across their networks? Are we switching into a fully uh, cashless economy? 
Well, so brick and mortar will always be important, right? Um, I think it is, it's what is going on in those locations that is, is important. It is conversations about how we can support you to prosper as a client, right? Rather than just being seen simply as a transactional point. The digital platforms, so your, your ATMs, or mobile banking, internet banking, those are really just to make it easier for you to bank and they're accessible 24-7. Mm -hmm. The branch will be really a point to have uh, deep conversations about how we can support you. All right. Yeah. It's never too late. Yeah. Thank you so much. Well, we've been speaking there to Kihara Maina, the Managing Director for i &M Bank Kenya, just giving us his uh, outlook for the sector and he is quite optimistic that the future is digital. At the same time, they're spreading their wings across the various countries within East Africa and they're also optimistic of having a very interesting turn of events along those lines. Well, at this point, we want to take a look at how the markets have been performing today.